everybody. Um, thanks for your patience. Uh, I'm Carol Williams. I, I'm your moderator for this session. A transdisciplinary approach to landscape transformation towards perennial diverse circular systems. And uh, Valentin, our project director, and I are going to be um, sharing the introductory presentation, which we'll get started here just shortly. Um, when our, our uh, wonderful helper here uh, helps us to overcome a technical difficulty here. And um, after the introductory presentation, uh, that will be sort of queuing up for you the, um, the next presenters who are connected, we're all connected to um, a, a, the same project. Although one of our presenters is, uh, will be giving uh, results from a, another but related type of uh, research that we all sort of hang together on some of the same central themes. So uh, are we there? It's loading. It's loading. OK. Um, does anybody know any good jokes? <laughs> um, tell me someone here is a stand-up comic in their spare time. No? OK. Uh, actually, Valentin is, so maybe he can help us. Um, anyway, uh, uh, just very quickly. Um, uh, Do you want to just try and change? Yeah. Change. This is when the director is behind the scenes going. A lot of chords. <laughs> I can juggle, apparently. You said they'd be there only to help with the presentations. You didn't really know what Right, right. OK. Hey, look at that. Carol. Nice. This is a draft, so there's going to be some slides that are not good. Afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties. I'm Valentin Picasso. I'm the project director uh, of the uh, Resilience Cap that we're going to be sharing to this, this session with all of you. So um, we titled this uh, presentation a transdisciplinary approach to landscape transformation towards perennial diverse circular systems. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the why, and Carol is going to talk a little bit about the how. And then you're going to see some of the results uh, from, the, from the other speakers today. Um, so I just wanted to start by showing a picture of where I'm coming from in the beautiful landscape of the grasslands of, of Uruguay, where I've learned the uh, beauty and the, and the importance of diversity and, and perennial uh, forage systems. Um, Carol comes from Kentucky. and. Uh, we missed the picture in the in the technical problem, but um, we'll 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 she'll introduce more about that later. But uh, if you've been paying attention to everything that happened in this Congress, everybody starts kind of with the same story. We have a global problem. There's a reduction in the grasslands. There's reduction in the area on perennial forages, whether it's in South America, in North America, or anywhere. Um, there's been a lot of examples, and I, I'm, I'm not going to show all the examples. I'm just going to remind us that that's how most of our presentations in this Congress have been. So we know that uh, grasslands are important. We know that perennial diverse forage systems are important, but uh, yet uh, we are, we're still losing them. There's, there's less area, and uh, we, we want to try to change that situation. And so uh, the, the prevailing agricultural systems globally, and, and in the US particularly, are simplified, are based on, on, on usually one uh, or two species in monocultures uh, of annual crops, whether it's corn uh, or soybeans or wheat or cotton. Um, and they are linear in terms of inputs, nitrogen, pesticides, uh, water, and outputs, grain uh, production usually, and, uh, and they very high on, on external inputs, including energy and fossil fuels. And also, they have very high productivity of, uh, of output of, of uh, calories. 
Um, and however, all those, as we all know and we've heard uh, before, um, they have a lot of negative environmental impacts that I'm just going to list and I'm not going to argue uh, about them, but we know, you know they, they create soil erosion, they create water quality problems, there's the carbon emissions, climate change, uh, uh, problems with air quality, loss of biodiversity, and, and those environmental impacts also are associated with socioeconomic impacts. We hear uh, everywhere about uh, uh, loss and fragmentation of rural communities, social exclusion, um, broad uh, economic, uh, the, 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 the economic social benefits are really not uh, accounted and, and, and have, uh, uh, are, are minimized, and also problems with human health. So, uh, and on top of all that, with climate change and all, uh, we have lack of resilience to both uh, extreme weather events and, and, uh, and climate change in general. So that's, that's a problem uh, that we're facing. And, uh, and we think that there are structural features of agroecosystems that um, can, are, are very important to address this, this problem. And one is diversity, the other one is perenniality, and the third one is circularity. So diversity refers to the number of species uh, over time. If we have a crop rotation that's diverse, it has several crops. Or uh, over space, we might have intercropping, we might have um, uh, forage mixtures, we might have uh, different species in the same uh, space, which uh, there's lots of studies showing that more diversity increases productivity, reduces disease and pests uh, and weed pressure, and increases resilience, and there's many studies showing, showing uh, data for that. Perenniality, it's another important structural feature that has to do with how much perennial is the ground cover, how much continuous ground cover and also root growth we have year round. Uh, of course, if we have perennials, we have less soil erosion, better water quality, more soil carbon and, and, and soil health, more nutrient retention, more pollinator habitat, more stability, and again, there's lots of, of papers uh, arguing for that. And the third one is circularity, which is recycling of nutrients uh, rather than linearly moving them through the uh, ecosystem to the air or to the water as, as pollution. And so systems that either integrate legumes or systems that integrate livestock both have a very important role on um, recycling nutrients like, like nitrogen. So diversity, perenniality, circularity are the three things that we think are important to address the problem. And, and when we think about cropping systems, we think uh, in these two axes of perenniality or continuous soil cover in the X and diversity or number of crops in the, in the Y. And as we move from our annual monocultures of corn or soybean to some uh, short uh, crop rotations, intercropping, adding cover crops, um, we're, we're increasing perenniality, we're increasing diversity, but really where, where, we, where the green is, is when we have perennial forages in crop rotations, uh, perennial grain forage polycultures, perennial pastures or perennial grasslands, and native grasslands as, as the top uh, of, the, of the, the creme of the creme. And as we move in that, in that uh, um, uh, increasing in that diagonal, that's where we have more ecological intensification, more use of the ecological processes to promote productivity, ecosystem services, resilience, sustainability. So um, our grant is about this, it's about diverse perennial circular systems. We, we want to promote diverse perennial circular systems. We know them before as forages, but uh, this is a new name, okay? And so we're promoting pastures, we're promoting forage mixtures, crop rotations with perennial forages, leaving mulches, um, anything that can add diversity and perenniality and circularity to the system. So this resilience cap, as we call it, is a, is a USDA funded project, one of those uh, sustainable ag agriculture systems, uh, large five year, $10 million grant, which uh, it's, it's aimed to address uh, really a, a, a bold critical innovation for sustainability and resilience. And in the long term, we really aim to increase 
the support uh, for adoption of diverse perennial circular systems, recommend federal and state policies to incentivize adoption uh, of, of these systems and increase the area of uh, diverse perennial circular systems across the US. Now, that's, that's what we wanna do, that's why we wanna do it, and, and basically it's you know, moving from those prevailing agroecosystems that are monoculture annual linear towards a transition into forage agroecosystems that are diverse, perennial, and circular. We have a problem in order to do that, that that has little to do with forage research. It has to do with socioeconomic and policy barriers, and that's why we're focused on that. And, and we hope to build a process that we can actually do this transformation, okay? Now, you wonder how we're gonna do this, and that's where Carol yeah. is gonna tell you. Thank you. So our approach, our, 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 the innovation uh, that we're bringing to uh, hopefully solutions here is a, through transdisciplinary research. Um, I'm just going to go right through here uh, because our technical problem has reverted us to an earlier version of this slide presentation. So what I'm prepared to speak to does not necessarily match the slide. So I'm going to be um, just zipping through some of them. So what we're looking for is uh, transformational change to uh, knowledge creation, access to knowledge, how knowledge gets shared, um, uh, particularly among people and populations that have been excluded um, from processes um, in creating knowledge and, and spreading knowledge, and also technology, access to, um, to markets, these sorts of things. And uh, that's what we think is needed to, to transition from the prevailing agroecosystems to the diverse perennial circular systems. So the transdisciplinary approaches, in our case, transdisciplinary research, um, is going to help make that transition. Um, I want to acknowledge many of our colleagues, particularly in Europe and elsewhere, that have been using transdisciplinary models of transdisciplinary research for decades. And um, so I just want to acknowledge all of the, the contributions that they have made to the field of transdisciplinary research and transdisciplinary practice. So basically what it is is um, an approach to change where there is collaboration that cuts across disciplinary expertises and also the involvement of uh, academics, non-academics, practitioners, and other stakeholders in framing the problem and framing approaches to solutions. So that's been a central part of the development of this project. We also are aiming to address complex real-world challenges. What is key to the RCAP, to the resilience cap, are the intentionality, the structure of how we're doing our work, and our organizational culture. So intentional, what's built into our collaborations is uh, relational knowledge. If any of you have read Mulaney Goodchild about relational systems thinking, is the idea that knowledge is not something that an individual attains on their own, but it is attained in relationship with others. So this is a central part of how we operate and um, in our practices. Um, we also, through um, very deliberate uh, design in project uh, coordination, um, bridging perspectives and learning to have shared meaning and understanding and also common language. So we have sociologists, we have uh, uh, forage agronomists, um, we have economists um, and others, and so we are learning to uh, speak the same language, look through each other's lenses disciplinarily um, so that we have a common way of understanding problems and um, going after some of the solutions and, and building the knowledge base. Um, inclusivity, that um, is not only just to um, expertise and disciplinary expertise, but also to rank and experience. Um, uh, and of course, across uh, gender, race, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have a very diffuse um, leadership structure and that helps with some of these um, uh, issues of equality and, and um, inclusion. And we have a basic organizational culture that I can say as project coordinator, it is my pleasure to work with everyone across the RCAP because of our culture of respect, accountability, and uh, cooperation. In our case, a lot of that has come naturally um, in some cases, um, that, that has to be carefully um, 
cultivated. Um, I'm about out of time, so I just want to say that the RCAP is organized around three, excuse me, six uh, major objectives. And in one of our objectives, a key part to our transdisciplinarity and our research uh, methodology is a national network of farmer collaborators. We have farmer collaborators in currently, I believe, in 15 states. We have collaborators in nonprofit organizations, uh, extension county agents, and others, uh, uh, state land grant universities, um, and others across 26 states. So we're geographically very widespread. Um, and our farmers are doing on-farm uh, data collection for us uh, in soil sampling and participating in uh, surveys and interviews with our sociologists. Um, I think at this point, in the interest of time, um, I'll just wrap it up there um, to say that, um, yes, we have faced many challenges in our transdisciplinarity, but in um, adaptive fashion, we are acknowledging them head on and together collaboratively coming up with solutions. Uh, we're in our second year of a five-year program, so um, check again in three years and we'll be able to report back on the transdisciplinary methodology. Um, at this point, I would like to introduce our next speaker and to give you a program note that because of Margaret's travel plans, she needs to be on a flight here very soon. Uh, she is being, uh, she will be presenting in Marisol Bertie's place. So instead of Marisol uh, Bertie speaking next, it is Margaret Crome. So Margaret. Yeah, one of those switches back there does that. Aha. I don't want to try to do it since we're seeing this right here. That's right there. Oh, no. No? It's not the whole Okay. Now I can do that. This should still be. Is it coming up? Yeah. I don't need a special mic. It's like already mic'd here. It's yep. Right here. Okay. Perfect. Great. Go. Hi, everybody. I'm Margaret Crome with the Michael Fields Agricultural Institute. One of the things I love about this project is that transdisciplinarity doesn't just mean within academia. It has meant from the start bringing in stakeholders and uh, groups, and that includes a person who does policy work. That's me and others as well, but I, that's the work that I do. And if you're a policy person, one of the first things you say is, what are we trying to do? We've already heard that from Carolyn Valentin. The next question is, what gets in the way? And then, are there any policy remedies appropriate to address those things that could get in the way? So this project got started with just a little tiny bit of lead time before the 2023 Farm Bill got started. And it seemed to me that one of the most useful things that I could contribute is finding out more about what are some of those barriers to uh, perennial diverse circular, diverse perennial circular systems. And so as opposed to doing the full surveys, which we are yet to, we're doing this coming year, starting on now, and interviews and focus groups, I got permission from our very flexible uh, principal investigator, Valentin, Jump in, go ahead. It's not part of our original plan, but that's the way the timing is, let's go. And I really appreciated that. I would like to just offer a little um, caveat that will give comfort to anybody here who has anything to do with USDA. We do not use any of the funding this for lobbying. Just thought I should state that. <laughs> um, so let me, oh, let's see. I think I know what to do. There you go. Uh, I won't go elaborating on that, it's already stated. Um, Interestingly enough, you can't see this very well. So we did four video focus groups starting uh, in early to mid-spring of last year. We had 16 participants across 10 states, across the United States, really working to get farmers 
and will be farmers. We wanted to get people who could help us talk about what the obstacles were as they were in real time struggling with them and we wanted established farmers. We wanted men, we wanted women, we wanted people of color, we wanted traditional white farmers, we wanted organic, we wanted conventional, we wanted also in perenniality, we wanted woody and herbaceous and woody. And so we wanted to get a sense what is it that are, what are the drivers and what are the, some of the obstacles? And we went through an IRB process. Uh, we followed up and, and as I said, we're following up this year with more. This is just to kind of give you some sense of some of the kind of diversity. Uh, our methods were as follows. Quickly, um, we identified potential participants by working through a lot of different networks. We had 16 different groups around the country helping us identify farmers. And uh, it was really effective. Uh, we ended up with a tremendous and effective diversity. We had, as you can see here, Illinois, Maryland, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Oregon, Texas, Virginia, Wisconsin, Wyoming. We really wanted uh, a lot of diversity and we got it. Um, and of course, as any IRB user will know, we had to maintain confidentiality. We protect our files. All of this is uh, passport, uh, passcode protected. And we paid a modest honorarium, $50. Each of the focus groups, about an hour and a half. And uh, we recorded them with permission and, of course, keep those protected and created transcripts. And we could then use the transcripts to go back and say, as we took notes, of course, during them, but we also went back and said, were there things that we missed? What were the patterns? What were the truths? And um, uh, what we had several of us who agreed upon what we found to be the key take home. So I'm just going to jump really quickly to that. Um, first, just to say, who we had, I've mentioned a few of the things, but I thought it's worth saying that of our 16 participants, at least five are people of color, at least five, uh, there were five who were women, and the farm sizes ranged widely. We wanted and we had at least one that was an urban agriculture system, we had agroforestry, we had um, silvopasture, we had traditional rangeland, we had a tremendous variety uh, and learned what the commonalities were. This is just an illustration of some of them. I thought you'd enjoy the, the livestock walking across up there. That's one of my farm tours in the driftless area of Wisconsin, and those are our, our biped livestock walking across on a very lovely sunny day in 2017. So what did we hear? We heard from farmers that there were a bunch of reasons to plant perennials. The biggest factor for most people really was environmental, and that won't probably surprise many of you, but clean water, soil conservation, biodiversity, and of course, especially increasingly, climate change concerns. Um, a lot of people also wanted to do it to simplify. They wanted to have, there's a quality of life associated with a simpler approach, and they wanted less labor, they wanted to have less complex systems, systems that they could manage. Uh, some of the pr challenges, and we'll go into this in more detail, but s one of the biggest challenges about perennials, especially woody perennials, is that they don't yield immediately. That's a big issue for farmers. If you're doing alley crappie and, and you're we're doing silver pasture or agroforestry, those systems, you're gonna end up having a, a syncopated timeline and you're going to have invested heavily up front and it's going to take a while before they begin to produce. You can ask Carol Williams this after we have that wonderful chance to see your, your chestnuts the other day. Um, that's an issue for a lot of farmers. Also, there's an opportunity cost. We've got very good prices overall for annual crops. It's hard to give it up <laughs> for a lot of people. It's like, I can get crop insurance for annual crops. I can get a loan for annual crops. It's hard to not have that. Um, a lot of lenders, a lot of other folks don't understand the value of or the mechanics and the nature of perennials. Um, the last, one of the last ones was risk management. Diverse perennials are themselves inherently less ris risky because they're diverse, but, and they're less affected therefore by some of the ups and the downs of weather and markets. But 
Uh, on the other hand, some of the structures to provide risk management, risk management agency, crop insurance, they are far less responsive on perennials. We heard about credit. Some of our producers were debt averse by nature. They didn't want credit. They just didn't want to go there, and that had been their long established habit. But it's also true that a lot of farmers would have liked to have gotten credit and have found it easier. And this issue of the long payback period is really tricky with many lenders. Conservation um, programs, there were some very excited, enthusiastic users of the US's Natural Resource Conservation Service conservation programs, the federal programs. have Many of the farmers got help with the watering systems, with fencing. They had great relationships. And we also had a number who found it much harder. And in particular, we saw a very clear pattern among the farmers of color. You'll see me refer in here in this to BIPOC, black indigenous person of color. That is referring to people of farmers of color. And many of them had several concerns, which we really have taken uh, as very important take-homes from this, this uh, set of focus groups. A lot of them work double, most, in fact, that we talked with, have another job. They're not just farmers, they have another job. They can't get off to go and meet in RCS's office hours. Uh, we've had people who actually, have a, a former state conservationist in the South, talked about USDA speak. You know, it can be very off-putting to have people, and there's some issues of trust. Sometimes you have very, uh, district conservationists serving several counties, and they serve one county much more favorably than another county, and many of the BIPOC farmers said they just did not have trust. Um, so there's real reason for that. It's a real concern for several folks, and we've talked with USDA about this now. Um, issues from a lot of farmers, not all, processing markets. It's really variable experiences. The direct markets are certainly the easiest, also very time consuming, not surprising. Processing turns out to be a pretty big issue for a lot of folks. It can take a very long time. We had some folks who are raising their perennial grain uh, and they're doing it organically and it is forever to get that processed. It's a real impediment, but that wasn't just in grains. It was across for meat, for pasture raised meat, for a lot of folks. Processing is a real um, impediment for a lot of folks. Um, Information, we asked a lot of questions about information, and honestly, what we heard is the best source of information is other farmers. I bet you anybody in here who's ever done work will asking that question, you will probably have heard something quite similar. Um, internet was a useful tool for younger farmers, but it wasn't something that the older farmers tended to find helpful. And um, there is a need for help at the national level in navigating uh, a lot of these topics, and it's lacking right now. Unfortunately, um, as a great fan of extension and the extension system, I believe in it firmly, and it, we did not hear a very strong endorsement from a lot of users. This is not, it's very variable across this country. Um, the agency, this is a really big issue. Uh, agencies are pretty complex. It's really tough to figure out how to navigate to get a program to actually help you to figure out which program you might apply to, how it could be useful, what are the challenges in application, navigating that for farmers who had already, um, and this is includes farmers of color who had, were well-educated and sort of, I'll say sophisticated, agency sophisticated, they were able to do it, but they all talked about um, other farmers that they knew who had a lot of challenge navigating the system. Um, a lot of folks said that it seems like uh, within the USDA, a lot of the federal programs are on a practice-by-practice practice basis, and the thing about diverse perennial circular systems is that they are more of a systemic way of thinking, and it's much harder to get support for that approach. Um, I think the last thing I'd mention here is that people sometimes do pretty often do in Wisconsin, I'm sorry to say, get turned down. We have a much higher rate of demand for, some, for example, NRCS programs, um, FSA, than they actually are able to receive. And it's the appeals processes within these agencies um, have not impressed the farmers with whom we spoke. Um, so conclusions. So what, what does this mean for policies? Well, obviously, we need to be working to have our programs offer financial support to tide perennials farmers over during those early years 
So this could look like an NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, payment for perennial establishment. For lenders, it could mean longer payback periods. And in general, we heard, without doubt, there's a need for a USDA paradigm shift. We have to be educating USDA programs and program leisure, leaders and staff about perennials. We have to be changing the loan, crop insurance, and conservation programs to intentionally support perennials. We need to be expanding processing infrastructure, and we need to expand and adjust some of the local marketing programs to support perennial farmers who want to sell directly. Within Extension, there's no doubt that we need to be doing some education, training, working to try to help pe people learn how to think about perennials and support perennial systems. Overall, uh, the Extension system needs to increase its capacity and its reach there. Uh, within the NRCS specifically, Natural Resource Conservation Service, we need to make EQIP, which is of the two working lands programs, that is not set-asides, but land uh, programs designed to help farmers who are working, we need to make it more accessible for new perennial farmers. The conservation stewardship program, we need to be uh, making, again, more useful for new perennial farmers. And I've already spoken to the challenges facing farmers of color, and so more flexibility, different hours, extending hours, and using trusted community leaders to help provide technical assistance. One final thought is, with all of the kind of complexity in the federal agencies, there's a need for some one-stop, sh not shopping, but resource obtaining and I personally am a big fan of the ATRA program, if any of you know, it's a project of the National Center for Appropriate Technology. It's the kind of source, it, there many, might be others who are really good, but another resource, I want something, and we think we heard the need for a, a trusted resource that is national, that can help people figure out what agencies they should go to, how to access them. So, thank you, I don't know if we have time for questions, we done. Yeah, we're squeezing today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. And again, apologies for the technical glitches uh, at the top of the, the session. Um, doesn't give us time for questions. So I mentioned earlier that our project has six major objectives, and uh, we, do, we don't have speakers today on each one of those objectives. Margaret spoke to our policy objective, and our next speaker is part of our data, our agronomic and forage data objective, and he's here to speak about one of our major uh, sub-projects uh, involving data. Our next speaker is Logan Marshall, graduate student in mathematics and computer science at University of Texas Arlington. Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon, and thank you for being here. As you can see, today I'm gonna to be speaking to you about something that we're calling the National Forage Data Hub. Um, and before I get into it, I would like to mention that the lead for this particular sub-objective of this overall project you've been hearing about today is Dr. Amanda Ashworth, who is a research soil scientist at the Agricultural Research Service here in the United States. Um, unfortunately, she was unable to be here today, so you guys are stuck with me instead. Um, as Dr. Williams said, I am a graduate student studying mathematics and data science at the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, so although I'm probably the farthest person in this room from being an expert in agricultural science or anything like that, I hope that I can effectively communicate to you today some of the potential that I see for modern data science to have an impact on the field of agriculture. And I plan to do that by telling you about the National Forage Data Hub. So what is the National Forage Data Hub? At its core, it is essentially a central data repository for forage data of all varieties collected from all around the United States. Um, I would like to claim that such a central data repository, um, along with the appropriate and necessary infrastructure, and that infrastructure being the 
other key component of the Forge Data Hub that I'll be telling you about in a moment. I would like to claim that these two things together actually form a bit of a system for us to start making connections between scientists and policymakers and universities and agencies such as the USDA and the NRCS and farmers and anyone else who might be interested in optimizing the functionality of our agricultural systems. Furthermore, um, I would like to claim that such a system is actually pretty vital for enabling us to make these large-scale optimizations that we've been talking about, such as um, moving towards greater perenniality and resilience and things such as this. So before I get into how we might exactly accomplish some of these goals, I want to get a little bit deeper into some of the infrastructure that I mentioned. So as I said, um, kind of the core component of the Forage Data Hub is the central data repository. So for all intents and purposes, this is basically just a big database meant for housing all kinds of forage data and any other data relating to forage systems. So pretty straightforward on that one. But all databases need data, of course. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is our data sources or data input streams, if you will. So currently, um, we're still in the process of getting this whole thing up and going. Currently, our primary data source has been legacy forage data, so data that's been collected in the past from previous scientific experiments. Um, and this data is often no longer in use and has already quote unquote served its purpose. Um, so we're hoping to repurpose that in the Forage Data Hub. Now some other potential sources of data. Carol mentioned the farm pair network. Um, so we're going to be collecting data from that, and we'll have nice information on farmers that are running um, the prevailing agriculture, the monocrop systems, as well as farmers who are running the perennial systems. And that's going to be a great source of data for us to make some comparisons and provide some additional evidence for transitioning to greater perenniality. Um, now we're going to have, before I move on, a couple other data input streams that I did want to mention. They're not a part of our project plan officially. But from some of the stuff I've been learning from this conference and just some ideas I've had, I can see, I mean, some like to say there's no fool like a young fool, so maybe I'm dreaming a little large here. Um, but I can imagine eventually incorporating remote sensing data or satellite data or LIDAR data or yesterday I attended a thematic session talking about near-infrared spectroscopy data and the information to help calibrate some of those machines could potentially be housed on the Forge data hub. So all of these data input sources coming from all these different places, different researchers, how is it that we can make sure that all this data actually works together? So there's quite a bit to this, um, but the key component is something that we call a uniform resource identifier, or a URI for short. This is very similar to a URL, which I imagine everyone's familiar with. It's the thing you type into your search bar when you're navigating the internet. So these URIs essentially allow us to uniquely identify any object or thing, concept, idea, that we might consider in a Forge system. So as an example, um, in the Forge Data Hub, we have a URI for alfalfa. And along with this URI, we have a primary label, and we have a number of secondary labels. So the primary label in this case would be the scientific name, so Medicago Sativa. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but... Um, and then we'd have a list of secondary labels as well. So alfalfa, I believe another common name is Lucerne. Um, and then perhaps even... So instead of having Medicago Sativa L, you would maybe have Medicago Sativa without the L. And then you might also have um, a bunch of common misspellings. And you package this all up underneath one thing that's called a URI. So now, if we assign these URIs along with all of the common terminology for each thing, this allows us to now search a variety of different data sets, different databases, and that recognize, even though this person says alfalfa and this person says lucerne, they're talking about the same thing. And the same thing applies to all sorts of other ideas. So we would have a URI for different locations, for different weather stations, all sorts of different species, perhaps different treatment practices, um, all sorts of stuff like this. And this will allow us to 
create a framework for working with all of these data sources that come from different locations, different places that are formatted differently, et cetera. So farther, the, so the infrastructure for the Forge Data Hub is essentially web-based. And because it's web-based, there is a lot of potential for networking with other databases. So some of you might be familiar with the USDA plants database. So just as an example, kind of tying back into what I was just talking about, if we get a new piece of data, or we get a new data set sent in for the data hub, and we go through it and we find that there is a species that we are not familiar with and then that we don't have a URI for it yet. What we could theoretically do is on the back end of the infrastructure for the Forge Data Hub, we could send a request over to the plants database and say, hey, do you guys have any information on this thing? And then we can search that database and they can tell us back, oh yeah, I know what this is. Here's all this common information about it. And then we can use that to help package together URI and then eventually accept this new data into the Forge Data Hub. Some other potential um, for networking with other databases. Some of you might have heard of the NOAA climate data or the USDA's web soil survey. We could, I guess I'll tie this in with the next point. So user interface, we're gonna of course have a user interface for this, um, this whole thing, the Forge Data Hub. And one aspect of that is of course gonna be a data querying system. So people will be able to come to our website and ask for this data from this location from this time that satisfies this condition. And along with just getting the data that we explicitly have in the Forge Data Hub, with this networking with other databases, there is the potential to maybe click a checkbox and say, hey, I would actually like to also get all of the NOA climate data that's relevant to what I'm asking for, or all of the USDA Web Soil Survey's soil data that's relevant to what I'm asking for. And on the back end, the software could go and gather all of that information and package it up nicely so that you don't have to go do that and worry about that for yourself. So that's just a couple of uh, possibilities with the networking. Other aspects of the user interface, we would like to have a visual dashboard that displays some basic information on kind of what data is actually housed in the database. So how much of this is annual data? How much is perennial data? Um, how much do we have of what types of species from what locations? Things like this. And we would also like to have some other information that can provide, I had a note on here. It's some, some information that can provide a better understanding of the benefits of diverse perennial circular systems to farmers. Um, so linking that into my final point here, which is analytics and decision support tools. Um, as you've been hearing, a big part of this overall project is making information like this more accessible, um, not only to scientists and researchers, but to farmers as well. So because this is all gonna be publicly accessible, farmers could come on and we don't want them to have to download the data themselves, learn some programming language and learn how to draw these analytical insights. So optimally, we will have some basic analytical tools and perhaps even some decision support tools um, inbuilt on the platform. So hopefully now you have a decent understanding of what I'm, what I'm talking about when I say the Forge Data Hub and what it is itself. Now I wanna kind of just mention a couple of the uh, points. I think it mostly speaks for itself, um, but pulling all of this data together like this obviously will increase data availability. Um, it's gonna be publicly accessible as I mentioned. So instead of having to go to all these different places um, and pull it together yourself, or instead of not having access to the information at all, um, having this Forge Data Hub is definitely going to increase data availability. And along with that, um, I think it's relatively straightforward to see how that would also help minimize research redundancy. Um, if you have access to more data, you have answers to more questions without having to go and gather the data yourself. Another aspect of this that I think is pretty important, um, and I think it solves, or at least has the potential to solve some of the questions that we've been raising in the previous presentations, um, and that's establishing a greater cohesiveness. So I did have a 
maybe about a year ago. I had spent two months, not two months, two weeks at the NRCS Tech Center in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and I got to learn a little bit about how they work. And combining that with some of the other things that I've seen, um, just working with different people at the ARS and traveling to different research locations, um, I have definitely noticed there's, there's lots of great stuff going on, but it's definitely disconnected and fragmented in, in many ways. And it's, you know, as someone new to the whole scientific community, it was kind of surprising. Um, so I think having a platform like this where you can bring all of this information together. To me, this is more than just the data. It's a place where maybe we can have forums for communications between farmers, between farmers and researchers, and sharing information this way. So that's how I envision it, uh, establishing a greater cohesiveness. And then, of course, all of this information flow and access to more data should allow us to better inform decisions, um, especially on the larger scale so as opposed to localized research studies that are um, limited to a particular location, now we can look across a variety of locations, across a variety of times, and use that information to better make decisions. And finally, my last data point here, provide fuel for next generation analytics. So by next generation analytics, I am talking about um, AI and machine learning. So I imagine, a lot of you have probably heard of ChatGPT by now. It's a very hot topic. Um, if you don't know, essentially it's an AI-powered chatbot um, that can answer just about any question that you ask it, and its responses are nearly indistinguishable from a human's response. And there's a lot of issues with that, and this is not a talk about ChatGPT. But I wanted to point it out because the reason it's able to do this is because it has a huge pool of data that it's trained on, that it learned from. So if we're going to be able to use some of these new technologies, um, such as machine learning and neural networks and these sorts of things, it's important to have a big database to learn from. So establishing that here in the Forge Data Hub will help us move towards that goal. So that is mostly what I had for you today. We have done, um, I, before I leave, leave, or in this, I would like to leave you with a little bit of a kind of where we're at right now, or where we were at as of March 2023. So as of March 2023, we had approximately 53,000 lines of data. Um, it's a li little bit more structured than it will be in the future. Um, and if you are interested in the kind of the data requirements, that's listed in the proceedings paper for this presentation. And among these 53,000 lines of data, we had data from 127 different locations and 52 different years ranging from 1958 to 2022, and this was over 150 different species of forage crops. So we also, with this data, we have done a few preliminary analyses, and these analyses have supported the claim that um, diverse perennial circular systems are in fact more resilient, at least to drought, than the traditional monocrop annual systems. Um, but I didn't want to get in that, into that today because I mostly wanted to tell you about the Forge Data Hub and the potential that I see for um, modern data science to have an impact on agriculture. So that's all I have, and um, I appreciate your attention. Uh, we have time for just one or two questions. Anybody? Yes, Chrissy. So it's, the plan is to be housing it in a government, uh, on a government server um, behind the government firewalls. As for long term, I did mention there's no fool like a young fool and this is me like getting involved in something that I'm excited about and I'm, I'm hoping that this lasts long term, but I can't guarantee for sure that it will. Um, I think if, it, if it's, as, as, it's excuse me, as successful as I imagine it to be, I'm sure there'll be enough funding to, to keep it running, but of course that's an that's a open question. Yes, please. Are you validate so there are a variety of checks and filters. Oh, 
Okay, sorry. So how are we going to validate the data that's submitted? Is that correct? So there are a lot of different ways to do this. Um, we can have different software programs and different algorithms that kind of check things automatically. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we're going to always have a kind of a queue, a stop in place um, before it's actually accepted into the larger data repository and kind of have a queue and people that are familiar with the data can go through and look with it and verify um, before it's fully accepted to make sure that this makes sense and that it's reasonable. And um, that's the basic idea of it. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, so just for the future when you're developing this Forge GPT, um, uh, one thing I think would be important is to have, um, you know, available seed, uh, how much cost the seed is. I think that's important for farmers. So just a comment for, for the future. Oh, thank you. I, I think that's a great idea. Um, I also think there's room for some, some other similar things to that. I mean, you could think about... Um, having a information location for different policies that are in effect in different locations and even have a history of the policies that have been there and how that's changed stuff over time. So thank you for the comment. Any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you all. Thank you, Logan. Thank you, Logan. Um, our next speaker is presenting on another one of our six objectives. And as Logan was pointing out, and as uh, we've mentioned before, the National Farmers Network, this comparison of uh, prevailing agricultural systems uh, in comparison to the diverse perennial circular systems, we imagine, uh, you can probably easily imagine that what is prevailing, say, in one agro-eco region is structurally and functionally different, so something in eastern Oregon, where it's arid and is going to be different, whatever is prevailing, and what is uh, well adapted for a diverse perennial circular system would be very, looking very different, say, in, in central Florida. So one of our objectives is uh, involving mapping and agro-eco region regionalization um, as appropriate to different forages, as well as decision-making tools that are being developed um, for farmers and other users. And so our next presenter, David Hannaway, is going to speak to his efforts in both of these areas. Okay, good afternoon to all of you. <clears throat> Hello. So my, my part of the program is designated as um, Extension 1.1. And the activities that I'm more involved with is identifying what species can be grown where. Thank you. <clears throat> and if you have a forage book and you flip to the middle of that forage book, they will have a compendium of different species. And they will show you the maps of where those species are suitable. And what I call those maps is crayon maps. So how many of you have a four, five, six-year-old? And they can draw a crayon map. But they're not very resilient, OK? They don't show you all the details of what can be grown where. 
And so what I'm trying to identify is what are the characteristics of the different species and where can they be grown? And if I can figure this out. So the page down, here we go. Okay, thank you. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is to identify the different climate species for lots of different species. And so if we're talking about what species are grown where, if you go around to the posters, there are numerous, numerous, numerous species that are grown. So we're trying to identify about 60 different species. So I sent out to our forage agronomists across the country, and we say, what species do you care about? And they sent a whole list of species. And how do we identify what the characteristics of those species are? And so we're talking about uh, different climate and soil characteristics. And so from a simplicity standpoint, there are lots of other characteristics that we could use. But we're talking about precipitation, T-min, or the minimum temperature. We're talking about the maximum temperature. What is the pH? What is the drainage? What are the salinity characteristics that define those species? So we're trying to say, what are the characteristics of those species that matter? And then to create the species suitability maps for all of those characteristics. And we're gonna talk about what are the things that make those characteristics work? So part of the characteristics is saying, what are the functions? Okay, so you can say, I know the characteristics of this plant. It has to have this amount of species, precipitation, all of the characteristics. But what is the response across all of those characteristics? So we're we talking about this, the characteristics. So we say, what is the percent yield of each of the species as a function of their tolerance to these characteristics? And how do we do that? We can't just say, oh, be Ballerstead and Marinta and all of the people across the country, we have our own perception of where that characteristic is, but what is the response function? And so we're going to create a precipitation, temperature, pH, salinity, drainage class. And what is the response of that to the different characteristics? And so what we're doing is creating a logistic or an S-curve. So an S-curve, so from the low to the high, what is the response of that? And how do we do that from a temperature, from a pH, from a salinity, from a drainage? Each of those have different characteristics. And so this is a mathematical function to respond to what are the characteristics. And you say, okay, where do we get that information? So if I ask you, or if I ask you, or if I ask you, you're gonna have different response. And so we're trying to get the USDA National Resource Conservation Service how do we respond to all of these? And this is not something we've done on a national basis. So you talked about the characteristics, and much of the characteristics are state by state by state by state. 
Everybody thinks they have the right answer, but it's not the right answer because it's not characteristic of all of the species from around the world. So we're trying to get range and pasture handbook. So NRCS has a beautiful resource for a lot of the species, but the individual states will say, oh no, that's not right, because north of I-70, it's not the same. If we go east, it's not the same as when we go west. And I talk to my species here, and they say, oh, that's not right. So how do we get it right? Online university agricultural resources. All of us as forage agronomists, we think we have the right answer. And we need to get the right answer from a logistic curve, from a Gaussian curve, from a curvilinear curve. How do we do that? So what we're doing is creating functions for each of these maps. And then we're using statistical tools. So the ArcGIS and then using statistical tools, my, Python and others, to say, where do, we, where do we find those relationships? And so we're working with mathematical and economical tools to create an index layer with georeferenced, create suitability layers, and then export those into a web-based tool. And so we're trying to create what are the species that work where and have the right tools to identify them. So suitability layers and export those to a website. And I'll show you what that website is. And the idea is to create forage suitability into highly suitable, so if we start at the top, well-suited, marginally, marginally, and unsuited, and show you a little bit of that. So the idea is to create an, a map of where those tools are suitable. So this is just one one clover suitability. Where is that suitability suitable? So this one is cura clover. Where is it suitable? So we talk very simply, we say from a green suitability to a brown suitability. So highly suitable, marginally suitable, marginally, and where does that work across the country? So we're saying, if we're talking about suitability of perennial plants, where are they suitable across the country? And then saying, this is where we can grow these. So we're talking about temperature, maximum and minimum, we're talking about annual precipitation. What we would really like would be a suitability curve for where that precipitation is occurring. But right now we don't have that information. We have annual, we have suitability for pH. We know f the suitability curve for various species. We have soil drainage. The other dr issue is we have the suitability curves from NRCS. Those don't work sometimes because drainage has already been fixed. We have salinity. Okay, so we have our objective is to create nine maps for each of the species. 
So we will create suitability for temperature maximum, temperature minimum, annual precip, pH, salinity, drainage. And then we will combine those into various tools. So all of the climate characteristics will be in one map. All of the soil drainage will be in one map. And then all of the total characteristics will be in one map. So where will we put that information? Okay, you say, fine, that's great, but where to put that? And we will say, we will create fact sheets. So many of you are familiar with extension fact sheets. And we will create fact sheets for each species. We have created for 13 different clovers in the Oregon Clover Commission and put that on one website. And now we will create a different website that will create for 60 species. So if you have any idea of how hard that is to do, uh, I'd be happy to talk with you. But right now, the forage is at oregonstate.edu under match clover. And these are some of the characteristics that we will have for each species. So for each species, we will define where, where are they, how do I identify, what is the growth habit, what is the climate and soil suitability zones, what are the suitability maps. And so those suitability maps will be one piece of the forage information system. What is the yield potential? What are the cultivars? And then even the image quality. Any of you, any similarity my age, we used to use slides, okay? And we made beautiful slides, and then we display those. But what do we do with slides today? We need to have an, an ability to create that image gallery and then where do we find that information across the world okay part of the information will be okay the farmer and the rancher when you say where do we where do we identify that information how do we know what to plant where and part of that will be a selection tool and for the clover species selection tool, we created a tool for these 13 different species. But now we need to expand that and say, how do we do that? And so there's going to be a, a clover tool that will be similar to the match clover tool. And identifying what are the characteristics that we need to select that tool. Okay. The other thing we've been talking about in various presentations is what about the future? And so we've worked with a, a University of Nevada Reno tool for identifying what are the T-min and T-max precipitations for the future. And what he has done is to use tools for identifying where are the tools that, where are the expectations, I should say, of the future. And so he's identified climate tools for now to 2099. I'm not going to be around here for 2099. Some of you may be. And looking at what are the tools for from now to the next 10 years, to the next 10 years, to the next 10 years. And so part of that will be what we will be as a, as a species suitability from now to the next 10 years. 
So we made some initial grant. So we've identified tools for all of these characteristics. So identifying what will work in the next few years, we have to have forage people, we have to have climate people, we have to identify the soils, the mathematics, and the GIS. And all of those tools have to happen. We've identified grant funds and College of Agricultural Sciences. So part of our work is working with scientists who will be the next scheme of people. So part of our work is with GIS, with forage and collaboration, as we've talked about the forage data hub. So working with those people. So we've had a lot of different characteristics, a lot of different people. Certainly the University of Wisconsin is an important collaborator. We have other people from different land-grant universities and we will work with them to identify the appropriate species. So I'm happy to talk with any of you with forage species suitability. We need people that can help us identify, are we identifying the right places in the right places? And I'm happy to talk with any of you in the future. So thank you for being here. I hope you will identify this tool and collaborate with us as we develop a good tool. So thank you and I'll give it back to you. Thank you, David. Do we have time? One question. There is one question, David. Did That's you have the, the monthly rainfalls and be able to calculate a sort of a Thornthwaite soil moisture deficit? Would be one way of calculating a, a moisture profile? Yes, that would be wonderful. Uh, one, one, one of my tools, well, I should have mentioned the PRISM data source from uh, Oregon State University uh, Chris Daly is the one that does a lot of that work. One of the tools that he gave me is keep it simple, make it work, and then fix it later. And so, yes, I'd, li I'd love to have more delicate tools. The problem we get into in science is we complicate the problem and then we never fix the problem. So the problem is get it simple and workable and then fix it later. So yes, please give me your data card and we'll work on making it better later. Thank you, David, and thank you for that question. Um, our next speaker, as I mentioned earlier, we had to swap uh, uh, speaking slots due to a travel concern of an earlier speaker. So our next speaker is Marisol Berti, and she is lead on life cycle uh, assessment uh, in the RCAP, and she's presenting today on some related research. We're a little bit early in the RCAP for our LCA, but she's going to speak to some related work. Marisol is at North Dakota State University. Thank you, Marisol. All right, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> um, thanks for, for being here. I know it's kind of late, but uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm part of this CAP, and I'm really excited to be part of it. It's been really fun. We're a lot of people here. I'm uh, the 
the lead of the objective two, which is the agronomic research, which includes the forage hub, includes the farmers uh, research network, and also the agronomic research that we're doing at many universities, all of them with the goal of how we integrate perennial forages into annual systems. That's what we're all trying to do. And so my little drawing there, diagram, kind of tried to see what we're going to do, right? We want to get all that diversity of animals, microbes, plants, everything, uh, by creating these systems uh, uh, in, in our uh, agriculture environments. So uh, also we have the life cycle assessment and environmental impact, which is what I work, because we want to know and want to demonstrate uh, that this is the way we need to go to really uh, improve our environment, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and uh, our polluting our waters. And so uh, these tools and modeling uh, really helps us. And the information I'll present is from my uh, cap that I have before this one, but uh, we are moving towards, and this is what we will do with the data that we're collecting on this grant, we will be doing this too. So that's an ugly picture, right? Unfortunately, it is a true picture of North Dakota. Um, and that's what happens sometimes on springs that were dry. Um, you can see the field is, is very, it has residues, no till it's still blowing. Okay, we're losing our precious resources. Uh, all the great Northern Great Plains have this huge problem of uh, erosion by wind. Um, all that soil that we're losing is very fertile soil and soil that has uh, a lot of nutrients in it. We're losing uh, the top soil. And so wh that's what's happened with intensif intensification of crop production. You know, we move towards uh, more monocultures, less diversity, and uh, of course we got a lot more yields. You will see the yield curve, they all went up, which is great. We're feeding a larger population. But with that, we start having all these problems that uh, that one of the reasons is because we took perennials out of the system. In the past, most um, Northern Grain Plains and Midwest, all farmers had alfalfa, you know, at least one part of the rotation or some kind of perennial grass. And they had livestock too, even maybe not too many, which uh, helped with the cycling of nutrients and keeping the system working. Well, we got rid of them, and this is exactly what happened. So with that, we lost. Um, you know, we reduce the crop diversity, lost uh, biodiversity, arthropods, not, not biodiversity only of insects, plants, but also of uh, microbes in the soil. Nutrient losses and loss of resilience. Now our crops, in a soil like this, if we get a drought, the yield will go down. This, this soil doesn't have the life they needs to be able to stand the drought. You know, uh, with all the fertilizers and inputs we lost, that capacity of that soil to be able to uh, resist drought and maintain yield and stable. So we pollute our water. Everyone has seen this picture, <laughs> not mine, you know, of the Gulf of Mexico, hypoxia zone because of all the nutrients in the water from the Mississippi River, you know, from the whole Midwest, uh, phosphorus and nutrient because we put fertilizers to try to increase our production, but half of that, that is going into the water because we don't have a system that cycles these nutrients. And that's why uh, this, this cap is really important because of that. So in here we see, I'll try to show. So this is our, our uh, you know, business as usual type in the Midwest, corn and soybean, two crops only, right? Where we have um, uh, parts of the season here where, where we have a very susceptible soil that to soil erosion to leaching and runoff of nutrients, right? We don't have anything to protect from losing. And then we're also, because of the soil is not covered, we're also losing uh, uh, CO2, nitrous oxide emissions, which are greenhouse gases. Uh, they're gonna impact you know, our climate. So that's the business as usual. Another business as usual more in, you know, in the dairy land where there's a lot of dairies in Wisconsin and other areas is to have this corn instead of corn, corn grain, maybe corn silage. And then they do still have alfalfa, which I'm happy there's still at least somebody has alfalfa. But this system is managed so intensively that actually it helps a little but not much because they're putting 
the, the corn, uh, the corn face is more common than the alfalfa. They just put it maybe a couple of years or three, if they do it. But the farmers prefer the corn because it's much more productive. Uh, when you do corn silage, you're taking everything out of it. You cut the whole thing, so all nutrients, everything you put, everything is going out of the field. You know, and people say, oh, we're fixing a lot of carbon. Yeah, well, you're taking it all out. And, a, and they say, yeah, but it's fixed in the plant. And they, you say, yeah, but when the cow eats it, it goes back to the air as CO2 immediately. So it's not, we're not fixing carbon, right? Maybe a little bit in the roots, but it's very little compared to what we're using. And then, so this system, they also started in Wisconsin, and I kind of follow up in North Dakota, I'm a copycat. I saw, hmm, that sounds interesting. I'm gonna try it too. So, is establishing the alfalfa with the corn, you know, using the corn as a companion crop for my alfalfa. Why would we wanna do this? Because I wanna avoid this soil not protected. By doing that, I have alfalfa the whole time, right? I have a cover the whole time. I don't have leaching because alfalfa is a fantastic scavenger, uh, right? And, and so I might have a reduction in, in yield, right, a little bit, but, but I'm gaining a lot of yield in the alfalfa in the following year because alfalfa is no longer going to be a seeding year of alfalfa, it's a full production year of alfalfa. So in this system, so the work I'm gonna show you is trying to compare the environmental impact of these systems, right? And so this is what happened, we wanna increase diversity and this is what we'll follow on this R cap, resilience cap to continue with it. So, these are the, the different sequences that we compare. We evaluated these by using models, um, not, you know, um, doing all this by measuring like soil carbon and nitrogen is very expensive. We're doing some of that on the cap here with uh, Dr. Chia Vegato. She's doing part of this and collecting all that data uh, to improve the models. But the, the work we did was with models. So we compare the typical corn, soybean corn. So these are sequences of three years. Uh, only alfalfa, three, so seeding year of alfalfa, two production years. Then the business as usual for there is where is corn, and then two years of alfalfa, but this year in the middle here is a, is a seeding year alfalfa and first production. And our new system um, of corn alfalfa intercropping, and now this second alfalfa year is the first production year alfalfa. It's not a seeding year anymore, right? What was really interesting for me, and I always talk to Dr. Graver, who started with this system, is actually the system worked better in North Dakota than it did in Wisconsin. And it's because, um, you know, the system has some problems in Wisconsin because corn grows so tall that there's not enough life for alfalfa. They also have so much moisture that alfalfa can die because of diseases. So they need a little extra help with some growth regulators to get the system to work. Well, I don't need that. Corn plants are a lot shorter. <laughs> because of this, the, the season is shorter, so we get a lot more life for the alfalfa. We don't, we are, we're much drier, so we don't have the disease problem. So the system actually works, and the, we have more than one publication, I put just one of them there, where we have all the data on yield, if you're interested, and nut uh, nutritive value of all the systems, and we did it in North Dakota, Minnesota, and Iowa uh, with our last cap. Uh, so here I'm just gonna present you the second part that we did, which was the environmental impact assessment, uh, we use mainly modeling. The DNDC model is called the composition, the nitrification model. It's a soil model that the models the uh, gains and losses of carbon and nitrous oxides and nitrate okay, in, in a system by using all the information about climate of the different locations when this was done. And uh, also, and then, we added that information generated for the modeling with the DNDC to the life cycle assessment using a, a software called CIMAPRO, which calculates all the emissions uh, produced by the production of the inputs and the we use, like the, how we make the urea fertilizer and all the, fi the, the fuel emissions and also all the um, uh, management of the crops, right? When we're using equipment, we're using fuel, uh, fuel, you know, has CO2 emissions. So we, we added the results from the DNDC model to the LCA model. Okay, and so we estimated nitrate leaching, uh, nitrous oxide emissions, carbon balance, and global warming potential. Um, 
oops, I was. <laughs> um, all right, one thing I want to explain, um, different LCAs, if you've seen people showing this kind of data, they show it on a kind of like 100 year estimation of global warming, right? Here we, we wanted to show, and it is, I know it's very short term, but we wanted to show what happened. This is a three year thing. So really what we calculated is the ins and outs, so this is balance. You know, carbon that went in for photosynthesis, carbon went out. Uh, this is what the model model for us. A nitrous oxide, nitrate out, and also we have some nitrogen input from the alfalfa system, and these are pictures from, from our plots where we have this system, okay? So the results I'll show you is on three years of this balance, okay? Uh, because sometimes it, it gets a little bit confusing. A lot of the modeling, like when we use the CIMA Pro model, models 100 year global warming potential. But we wanted to show, even in a three year rotation, the changes you can make, because that's what we're interested, right? We don't want to tell the farmer what's going to happen in 100 years from now, right? Because it's not as interesting. So, quickly for the results, because I don't want to use too much time, but. And the nitrate leaching uh, model by the DNDC model, obviously, well, a lot of these results are obvious for you, right? Worse was corn, soybean corn. Uh, a lot of leaching, alfalfa was a minimum. Alfalfa is a fantastic scavenger. Alfalfa will take all nitrate in from the soil before it fixes nitrogen. Why? Because fixing nitrogen is a very expensive process for the plant. It has to give sugars, carbohydrates to the rhizobia to do it. So if there's nitrate, it's not gonna do it. So it can't clean up the soils. They actually use alfalfa as a clean it up spill, clean up spills because of that capacity. So you can see no nitrate losses. And the other systems, um, we had, you know, uh, we had uh, corn in one year. So remember, this is a cumulative thing of the three years, right, ins and outs. So of course, because we have one year of corn in there, we have a little more of uh, leaching but the one with intercropping, even we have the corn in year, the corn was with the alfalfa intercrop, so it's, it's a, a slightly lower, okay? But not significant, but, but why? This is why, right? The alfalfa roots are very, very deep, right? They can really clean, uh, keep that nitrate in the system. That's the circularity part, right, of our DPCS. They keep it in the system when you have alfalfa. So this is really a, adding only one perennial crop to an annual cropping system. And you can see the changes that happen. Now, in the nitrous oxide emission was a little bit similar. Uh, again, the corn, soybean corn was much higher than the ones that had alfalfa. So I'm just trying, I'm, you know, I'm a fanatic of alfalfa, best crop in the world. <laughs> you know, uh, we reduced those nitrous, ex, uh, nitrous oxide emission during those three years, right, of the balance. Right, and uh, uh, the alfalfa alone was the lowest, right, was the lowest because we are not adding fertilizer like we are with the, with the corn, and we are not, uh, uh, and, and then scavenging all the nitrate that could go as nitrous oxide, uh, and you know, here. Remember, nitrous oxide comes out of the, the denitrification process. You know, when we apply a fertilizer as an ammonia or urea, it nitrifies to nitrate, we either lose it for leaching, or if we had excess water, it denitrifies and goes back at the air as a nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a very potent greenhouse gas, very potent. It's 298 times more than a CO2 molecule. So it really adds to the global warming potential. Now the other two, because we have the coin year, it's a little higher, right? Not much of a difference between our uh, system with intercropping or the regular corn and alfalfa system. So very, uh, uh, that is not bad news, right? We're still reducing compared to the, this, this one, the way don't want. I don't know if I want to quote what you said, but can, can I quote what I just said? She said, don't quote me, don't quote. <laughs> she said, we were in the field in her farm, she said, can you see what happens when you stop growing corn and this beautiful diversity of grasses? He said, this is what happens when you stop growing corn. I told Carol, I said, I'm gonna call you because that's amazing. That's what happens when you start uh, growing corn, you really do that. So, and so this is the last one of the results. I summarized it a lot. So the, I could talk, you know, an hour on this slide of, because there's many things going on. But uh, one thing that we gotta keep in mind when we work with modeling, the results are as good as the assumptions you make, 
okay? <laughs> so uh, it can be discussed again, so we can, some people say, no, I don't agree with you. Well, it's modified. So it's very important to always keep in mind what were the assumptions to do to create this, right? Because I can vary the assumptions to get what I want, right? But we try to keep the, as realistic as possible to see in this three year we can show, because for us this is visual. I show the farmers, look, in three years, by incorporating a farm strategy system, this is what's happening, right? So this is the, it's really not a potential long term. It's really a balance of carbon, but includes the LCA. So that means it includes not only the CO2 in and out, it also includes the CO2 use in producing urea, the fuel use and all that, right? Because it's combined both the LCA with the DNDC. So now the, the values are kind of turn around, right? Uh, a positive value means that after three years, my balance is positive, that means I lost carbon from the system, right? It's, it's the opposite of what it shows on the bars, right? Uh, when I have only alfalfa now, I'm pretty even, in three years, so the, the carbon in is photosynthesis, right? Uh, carbon out is soil respiration. Uh, this is carbon uh, CO2 equivalent, so includes the nitrous oxide too that is, losing, is lost, right? With alfalfa, I stay pretty much even in three years, right? I don't lose, I don't gain. When I add corn and alfalfa, uh, things change. And some, somebody say, well, why if I alfalfa, corn alfalfa, I'm getting more carbon, this, is, this negative value means that I gain more carbon, right? These are the values. It's because the assumption, and that's why I say the assumption, we did this an assumption which is our system in North Dakota has no tillage. So we're incorporating 50% of, I mean, of the whole biomass, all the photosynthesis carbon that is in the corn, 50% goes back in the soil, right? And the other 50% goes back out in the grain as grain, right, out of field. But we're putting 50% 50, 50 of residue in there, right? Uh, <clears throat> and so that's one thing, so that's residues there, and then we are planting alfalfa, right, uh, after that, but that residue stays on the system in three years. Now, if, you, if I do this in 50 years, that might not be there, because it's gonna be mineralized and out of the system. That's why assumptions are very important and what you, you, how to interpret this. Now, this is what I kind of want to show, right? When we did intercropping, it changed even more. Why? Because the first year I did intercropping, I did not harvest alfalfa. When I harvest alfalfa, I use fuel, I use equipment, you know? In the seeding year, it's to harvest, and this year I didn't have to. Yeah, I'm almost done. In this year, I didn't have to harvest it because I'm establishing with the corn. Right, so I'm saving all the fuel, so the CO2 I'm saving on this balance. Is that is the, also the, the less nitrous oxide produced because I'm scavenging nitrate possible. So there's a lot of reasons why this happened. And this is, to me, exciting, right? Because in three years, by integrating alfalfa into a system, I actually could make a difference. So that's for the research, and uh, I pretty much told you what the conclusions. The future research and what we're doing with our cap is, is pretty much what we're gonna do with it. I think we have, what, 17, 15 experiments, Marilia, that they're gonna generate information and we're gonna run them through the models to get this. But we're also adding the diversity part with Dr. Lamp in Maryland, and some of my students already are doing this. You know, uh, Haley, my PhD student is here. She took those pictures. Um, they say a picture is a thousand words, right? I don't have to tell you that corn, Alfalfa and corn alfalfa look different, don't they? <laughs> so um, the diversity of insects, I never done biodiversity work with insects, never. I, the diversity of insects is incredible. It was, it, uh, it was really crazy how many, uh, how many uh, there were in here, how many uh, crops. Um, we're also, before, we're also doing not only diversity on insects, but working with other projects. I have several projects related. Uh, we're also working with mycorrhiza diversity, rhizobia diversity. We're trying to, uh, to, to go a little farther in diversity than just insects. Uh, it's really fascinating. Like I said, I could be talking for an hour. And now my student is doing also uh, working with uh, soil pit traps for crawling insects and different crops, right? 
And we're going to start working with the cap. We're working with Sunflower. And I got a NIFA project, too, on Sunflower alfalfa now. So <laughs> we're going to do the same thing uh, with different crops. And we've been so uh, happy uh, that NIFA has really supported us. I don't know, 10 years ago, it's like, are you crazy? <laughs> now, uh, all this intercropping, because of the benefits it has to the environment, is super exciting. I'm super excited. I'm having really fun. So a lot of people say, why do you want to be there? Uh, I'm really having fun with my students. This is, this is a great, uh, these are all the NIFA projects, including the, the, the RCAP, uh, that we have funding to be able to do this and have fun, right? So you get funding to have fun, that's great. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marisol. Um, I think in the interest of time, if you have questions for Marisol after our last presenter, you can catch Marisol and follow up with her. So as we mentioned before, we have six major objectives and two that you have not heard from yet are our extension objective and everything that's wrapped up in education. And Kim Cassida is here to speak to both of those. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, how do I get this going? <laughs> <laughs> what? 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 Which one are you? Um, lamp and cast. Lamp and cast. And then I think we have to get you in the presentation mode. Yeah, just go to slideshow and from the beginning. There? Yep. All right, whoops, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. All right, <laughs> we're saving, um, I, I, I probably should say that we're saving the best for last, but actually what we saved for last was the, um, the uh, objectives that don't have much done yet. Because a lot of what we're doing is dependent on the other objectives, and so we are waiting for them to um, generate some data so that we can then educate and extend upon it. <laughs> um, Bill Lamp's not able to be with us here today, so I'm going to attempt to present his material as well as mine. Um, I'm going to start out with the extension objective, <clears throat> and that is the one I'm in charge of. Uh, in our proposal, we described that as having the purpose of conceiving a new narrative. Um, I thought that was quite ambitious of us, but we're going to do our best. Develop actionable tools and communicate concepts to farmers, consumers, lenders, and policymakers about the benefits of our DPCS systems, okay? Our team is everybody on our project. <laughs> and I feel a lot of the times like I'm herding cats because there are a lot of people on our project. Um, but I also have to uh, give a nod to Shelby Gruss. Um, my postdoc, who has been uh, invaluable in um, helping us to pull all this together, and she's sitting in the back, so you can wave at everybody. Um, <clears throat> you've already heard about a few of these things, so I'm not going to talk about uh, the forage species selection tool anymore, uh, because uh, David's already told you about that. But that is one of our featured actionable tools that we are going to be uh, developing, and that will be... Um, part of our website, it's actually going to be on David's servers, but we're going to have a link to it on our group website that will uh, direct people to everything else that we are doing on the project. We also have another web tool that will be developed, um, and it is aimed at helping people determine what ecosystem services they can expect to get from particular forages or forage combinations. Uh, James Mitchell at the University of Arkansas is going to be working on that, and it's dependent on the results of Marisol's LCA analysis, so we're waiting for that to be done before he can start working on that. Um, but we're really looking forward to that as being a very valuable tool. <clears throat> And then we get down to our more uh, I don't know, conventional extension um, communications. We're going to have a website, where, which will be our central clearinghouse for everything. Um, that's actually pretty close to uh, being published. Uh, we'll have our, your typical print publications, videos, webinars, social medias. Um, we are looking at 
holding field days for farmers, um, and we are developing a stakeholder network, which is what I'm going to talk about a fair amount here today. First, I'm just going to say a couple words about the cooperative extension system in the United States, because I know not everybody in this room is from the United States. So how does it work here? Um, the motto, you might say, of cooperative extension would be translating research into action. Um, and I've always thought that we in the United States have it only half right, because we are very focused in this country on taking research and turning it into information for farmers. We are very poor in this country at listening to the farmers and what they need and taking that back <laughs> in the other direction. So that's one of the things we're trying to change a little bit with what we're trying to do. As our typical system here would start with federal funding, it will trickle down through our land grant universities, which are um, each state mostly has one of those that's targeted with um, agricultural research and, uh, and education, and then move down into the local offices. And you see there are no farmers in this graphic anywhere. <laughs> <clears throat> Oops, wrong button. All right, so we are trying to t do this a little bit differently. We have the transdisciplinary team. We've already talked about that, but we're trying to get our people out of our disciplinary silos and moving up into transdisciplinary territory where everybody's talking to everybody else. Uh, we have a lot of different disciplines represented. I've probably forgotten some of this when, some of them when I put this together. Uh, there's a lot of different opinions here about what we are doing and how we should do it. It's been a challenge. One of the things that Shelby and I did right from the beginning when we started working with our state collaborators is we wanted to find out how um, the extension was set up in each of our collaborating states. So we uh, just sat down on a Zoom meeting with each of our state collaborators and we tried to get some information about how things were done in their state. So some of the things that we were trying to find out uh, included uh, the relationship between the university and the county agents or educators. Um, the people out in the county, they're the boots on the ground people. They're the ones that are usually interacting directly with the farmers. I will also point out that depending on the state, they will get real touchy about whether you call them an agent or an educator. But we do still have both in this country depending on the state. You got to get it right when you're talking to them. <clears throat> we wanted to find out about their administrative structures, which are similar but different. Um, we wanted to find out what kind of ex uh, support they had within their states for different extension uh, programs, you know, funding, assistance, uh, you know, just how things were set up. How far do they have to travel in their state? to get to their clientele, all right? Um, I'll, sh I'll give some results of this in a minute. What are the preferred communication strategies amongst the farmers? What is the structure of a typical field day and, and what, are the, what is their um, funding model for events? So some of the things that we found out when we're looking at, um, when we're looking at the structure is that there's two basic models. We do still have some states that um, have a agricultural agent or educator in every state, all right? That used to be the norm, all right? It is no longer the case everywhere. Uh, budget cuts, you know, you know the, the drill. Um, a lot of states um, are starting to lump counties together and having, um, one agent may be covering a, a really large territory. So that leads us to a regional model, which might just be one generic agent or educator covering a large territory, or more often when they shift to a regional model, they start to specialize. So they'll say, you are the beef agent, and you are the forage agent. And so you're gonna help all the people you know, that cover that part of, uh, of, um, of need in your state. And generally, the more they do that, the bigger the territories get that people are having to cover, and, when, and people just get spread out too thin. <clears throat> Another thing is the size of states. Um, we have a lot of variability in the United States about the size of states. We have some states that are approximately the size of a single county in other states. 
Um, and then we have um, some states that might take 12 hours to drive from one side to the other. Um, so this becomes a um, considerable impediment to people being able to actually visit farms. If you have travel times that might be five hours or more from your office to your farm um, that you need to go visit, that is a funding problem as well as a time problem. Also, many of our states have multiple ecoregions. Um, David ta talked about that in relation to what species we grow. So when I, for example, when I worked in Arkansas in extension, you might as well not even, I was in southern Arkansas, you might not as well even think about what they were growing in northern Arkansas because it was not the same as what I could grow where I was. Um, so there's <clears throat> a lot of challenges with that. Support. Um, we found that most of our uh, county people and state specialists had support for layout and design of print media. We still have that. Um, it was quite variable about whether or not they were going to have support for professional videography. You know, anyone can go out with your cell phone and take video, but that's not generally the best quality that we would like to do when we're really doing a professional job to reach people. Um, and also the event funding is highly variable. Usually events are expected to pay for themselves. So either the, uh, you have to charge a fee which doesn't go over well with clientele, um, or you have to find sponsors because everything costs money. If you're going to serve them food or something, it's going to cost. Communications. Many, many, many of our farmers still prefer, prefer print media. All right? We've tried <laughs> diligently to switch them over to online uh, sources of information, and some will do it, but a lot of them still won't. Um, and there's reasons for that. Sometimes they can't. We still have problems with rural broadband access. Um, and also there's a highly, um, a very high variability in acceptance of social media. A lot of the younger farmers will use it, the older farmers not so much. All right, when we look at the structure of field days across the country, um, it is also variable in the southern part. We could do that all year long. Um, and the attendance might be anywhere from 10 to 100. Um, in the northern states, you're only going to be doing field days in the late spring, summer, fall, especially not in um, North Dakota. <laughs> um, in the wintertime, in our northern states, I'm from Michigan, um, we do online or meetings. So we have that registration fee versus sponsorships. It's getting harder and harder to find industries to sponsor meetings. They're getting tapped from her, the economy is not very good. Um, it is really difficult to get the farmers to pay for it. Uh, we have uh, universally acclaimed that providing food is very, very important if you're doing any kind of a in-person uh, program. And depending on the part of the country, it might be a half day to a full day event. It might be in the morning or the afternoon preferred, sometimes the evening. You need to know which it's going to be depending on what state you're in, because if you try and pick the wrong time, it's not going to go over well. All right. So this is all a challenge for our, pro for our project, because when we try and get our message out, we're going to have to present it different ways in different places, because you really have to present it the way people are willing to accept it. All right. Now we tried, um, one of our big things is doing a farmer network, and this has, uh, we thought this would be pretty easy to do, but it has proven to be quite a challenge. Um, we are relying heavily on the existing state extension teams to locate these farmers. Those agents and educators are integral to this process because they're the ones that know the farmers. Um, a lot of the farmers are reluctant. Uh, we've had some success using this flyer here. Um, which we distribute through social networks. But again, if the farmer's not looking at a social met network, they're not going to see this. Um, targeted calls work pretty well. If you can get a name of somebody who might be interested and you can get a hold of them, which is the challenge, um, you can have pretty good success. Cold calls do not work well. We do not advise those. So some of the obstacles that we've run into is that immediately when we set up um, and started to talk to people that we were going to be looking at the local dominant system versus a DCPS system, we immediately ran into this projection that people thought that the dominant system was the bad one. 
all right? We were not presenting it that way, at least we were trying very hard not to, we thought, but that is immediately what people assumed. And nobody wants to be the bad farmer in the pair. So um, the whole concept of a paired comparison scared them. They didn't want to be compared to anybody. Um, that's really just a statistical model. We're using a paired t-test to do our comparisons, but we shouldn't have told them that <laughs> because it scared them. Um, we thought it would work well if we said, well, we got one farmer, you know, can you suggest one of your neighbors that might uh, help participate? And that didn't go over well either for two reasons. One, about half the farmers were like, I don't want my neighbor to know that I'm doing this. And the other half of them were cooperating. So, you know, they were sharing fields and equipment and things with their neighbors and we couldn't separate the two operations for our economic analysis. Very, very concerned about data privacy. No matter how many times we tell them that everything is confidential, they do not, they do not believe that. They are certain we're going to be giving that information away to somebody, which leads to trust as being an issue. Um, it's also really difficult to find those underserved farmers that we particularly want to reach because we're already not reaching them, and so we aren't finding them when we go out and look for them. Um, many of the farmers are very reluctant to use email. Um, and one thing that we recently have uh, run into is that we've discovered that there is a really large amount of competing similar projects using survey and soil sampling paired design pro uh, type projects. And we're running into people who are going, well, I've already signed up for this project. And we're like, no, you haven't. It's like, well, it's some other project that is so similar that they can't tell the difference. So. <clears throat> Just a few things to keep in mind if you find yourself out recruiting farmers. And I'm going to leap into the education part and hope that I can present Bill's information adequately. So our leader of the uh, education objective is, is Bill Lamp at the University of Maryland with his helpful assistant. Um, and he's got 10 participating state coordinators um, that are doing all these things in their states. <clears throat> If in the interest of time, I didn't list all of them. So some of the things that the education group is doing, and I should also point out, I am part of the education group as well, so I have been participating in some of these. So I have a little bit of knowledge about them. Um, we are preparing educational activity reports. So we're trying to document any time we do any kind of an educational activity within the grant, what exactly are we doing and trying to report it in a standardized way. Because as any of you who have ever worked in extension or education knows in the modern world, it's all about your impact. So you have to be able to document that in some way. So we have the standardized uh, report format, which I know you can't read. Um, that we try and put together for each event. <clears throat> we are also putting together educational modules. These will eventually be put up on our website once it's good to go. Um, and the idea here is that if we get something that works, we can put together how to do it and other educators can come and get that and use it um, in their curriculum. So there will be um, a background, the guidelines for the instructors, the learning objectives, what sort of materials do you have uh, to put together, and exactly how would you conduct this activity. Um, and we hope to have these um, on a large number of different types of activities that we might do over the whole project. <clears throat> we are holding graduate seminars. Um, we have tried to set up something that would be an actual course that we could set up across universities, but uh, so far that has kind of defied our ability to get universities to cooperate on things like tuition and time and grading. Um, we're, we're still working on it. But University of Maryland does have a course um, called Sustainability Challenges and Prospects that we hope to kind of model this after, where the students will meet, discuss issues that are related to resilience, and, and use that as a learning experience. And we really would like eventually to be able to have students from other universities also be able to be part of that. <clears throat> we have cross-university undergraduate internships. So many universities here in the United States will have, during the summer vacation, the, um, the students may actually be required to do an internship. At least I know at Michigan State they are. Um, they have to find an employer who will take them on. And, and teach them something as well as pay them. 
So we have money available to pay these students, but in return, they're going to be doing a fairly structured internship within our program. So this is the first summer we've actually been able to do this formally, and I think we have six of our universities have some, have some people set up so far. Is that my timer? Well, good, because I'm almost done. All right, and then we have um, the Resilience CAP Graduate Forum, and this is a fairly new piece that is actually uh, catching on really well with our graduate students, because we have all of our collaborators in all of our states, many of us have graduate students. And so what we are doing is having those graduate students meet together by Zoom um, to meet educational goals. We want them to learn how to manage projects like this. They're gonna be, they're gonna be us someday, right? We want them to learn all about the environmental things that we are, uh, that we're dealing with. And we want them to learn about the education and extension and how you get that information out and how you listen to your clientele. So they're meeting once a month. Um, they have guest speakers sometimes, either from in or outside of the project. They discuss papers. They do all kinds of fun stuff. And they're very excited about it. And lastly, um, we're looking for opportunities to build off of what we're doing from other funding opportunities to um, move forward with uh, more understanding of our goals. And that is what I have. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. I I think we're at the end of the time for our session, so if you have questions, um, it, well, I'll ask our speakers to, to come to the front of the room and congregate up here, so if you have questions for any of them, please come forward and, and join us. Thank you so much. <laughs>